um, review the role of the web server in these sorts of pages. And then we'll get in to cover um, the rest of the topics we have concerning forms. Um, after that, we will um, migrate into talking tables. We really have uh, a handful of main topics. We're getting down to the wire. Of course, anything that you uh, do, uh, anything, any questions that you have concerning your project uh, is a priority. So um, we can make class time for that. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to bring them up during class or during the lab. Uh, we'll wrap up tables today. I'm sorry, we'll wrap up forms today, and we'll start tables. Um, I don't know how far we'll get on tables. Um, we might finish it. We might have some more to wrap up next week. Um, after we wrap up tables, the last topic that we'll cover will be JavaScript. Um, at any rate, the idea of forms is like this. We have many websites um, that produce different output depending on the circumstances. And those websites are often called dynamic websites because their content is not static. What do we mean by static? Static in this context means unchanging. Dynamic means changing. So for example, if we were to go to Canvas, perfect example. All right. If you were to log in the Canvas and I were to log in the Canvas, we are both accessing the same page when we go to the dashboard. All right. However, your dashboard is going to look much different than my dashboard. Why? Because we each logged in. In other words, we provided the server some information. Uh, in this case, we provided the server information about who we are via the, via the uh, login and password. And as a result, we get different information out from the server. So it's not as though there are a bunch of web pages out there sitting and waiting to be delivered. All right. There is one web page, but it's a special sort of web page. It's a dynamic web page. And it is not written in HTML, though it produces HTML. So the scheme is sort of like this. We are the client. The client is the person that is accessing the web pages, requesting them. And it could be a computer. Um, it could be, um, you know, it could be a person at a computer, it could be a person at a mobile device. It could actually be something like a search engine that is crawling the web and looking to index uh, all the pages that it finds. In any case, you have a client that makes a request through the internet. We draw the internet as a cloud because It's not a direct path from the client to the server. There's many sort of hops on the way. And it may go between a variety of different computers, all part of the internet, and so on. We're not terribly interested in the details of that. All we know is if we make a request through the internet using the domain name servers that we talked about last time, and the IP addresses and the domain names, your request makes it to the correct web server. The web server then sends a response back. And in the case of static web pages, that are pages that you like, to, like we've developed so far in this class, the request comes in and the page is simply delivered. It's sort of like if you order a Big Mac at McDonald's, there's a Big Mac sitting there in a bin, the server simply grabs it and hands it to you. All right? There's no special processing involved. It's just there, it's pre-made, it's sitting there waiting for the next person that asks for it and it's simply delivered to you. Yeah, just like that. Just like that. So we have a request and a response. The response, when we're talking about a web server, is going to be a web page. And that will be in HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and any other files that are part of the result. Now, clearly in the case of Canvas, this model doesn't work because there isn't a pre-written web page out there for every single person. All right? If you can imagine how um, difficult that would be to maintain, there would have to be how many, you know, there's thousands of students, you know, um, that, that attend LC. 
I don't know the exact number, but I would think around 10,000-ish or more students that attend LCCC. Well, that would be a lot of web pages to have and to maintain. And um, when someone adds a class, you'd have to change their web page. And when someone drops a class, you'd have to change it and so on. So that really, that model doesn't really seem to be feasible using static web pages. Well, it's not using static web pages. It's using dynamic web pages. And with dynamic web pages, there are languages that run on the web server, such as PHP or Python or ASP.NET using C Sharp and so on that can integrate with the database. And when the request comes in, the program puts together a web page sort of on the fly, specific for the person's request. So you type in your credentials, your username and password. Those credentials are used to pull out what courses you're attending this semester and so on. And it creates a web page on the fly just for you. And it delivers that to you. All right. Now, here's a key thing to remember. In both cases, whether it be a static page that's already written and sitting out there, or a dynamic page where you have a program that creates the web page on the fly, what gets delivered to the client is a plain old web page that contains HTML, CSS, JavaScript. It's just a matter of if it's pre-written or if it's assembled on the fly. And the analogy I give, if McDonald's is a static web page, someplace like Subway would be the dynamic web page, right? Because they don't, if you go to Subway, they don't have a bin in the back with every possible sandwich that anyone could order, right? right? No, it would not be feasible. You know, an Italian on wheat bread, an Italian on white bread, an Italian on white bread with cheese, without cheese, with provolone. With, it just doesn't make sense, all the different combinations. So instead, what do they do? They assemble the sandwich on the fly, and they create it just for you as you order it based on the information you provide them. So you say, I want a turkey club on wheat with provolone, toasted, and spinach on it. Right? They go and they make that just for you, and they deliver it to you. So all the ingredients are there, just like all the ingredients for the web page are there in the, in the database. The, your request comes in, and it provides, and you provide additional information to the server, and they create a web page for you. But it's important to note, in either case, whether you're talking about Subway or McDonald's, you're leaving with a sandwich. All right? You're leaving with, in the case of a web server, you're leaving, you're getting delivered to you a complete web page. It's just a matter of whether that web page was, was finished, sitting out there waiting for you, or whether it was assembled dynamically on the fly. All right? Now, in the case of web pages and not sandwiches, the input that you give uh, to the web server is, comes in many forms. Um, you give your IP address, which gives the web server some indication of what your approximate location is. So based on your IP address, it can tell who your internet service provider is and get an idea um, that you are in Illyria, for example. All right. Um, it knows what platform you're running. It knows if you're on uh, a, a, a PC or a uh, mobile device. And it knows if you're on a Mac or a PC, if you're on a Android or iOS or whatever. So it knows some characteristics about um, who, you know, uh, what, what equipment you're running. But the part that we're interested in for this class is it knows information that you provide on a form. So in the case of Canvas, the information you provide on the form, of course, is your username and password. That gets sent to the server. That retrieves information from the database concerning what classes you're taking. That information is put together by the scripts on the server to create a web page, freshly baked for you uh, and gets delivered to you. Uh, in the case of Google, we can see a couple things take into uh, consideration. Um, we saw last time was if you Google Italian restaurants. You're going to get a list of Italian restaurants in the approximate area. 
So Sereno's is just up the road. Olive Garden is, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes away, and so on. Now, clearly that's made just for us, right? Because if you were in California and searched for Italian restaurants, you wouldn't get these same three ad, uh, uh, restaurants in Leary, Ohio. All right? You'd get three restaurants out in California. So some of the input that comes in from, uh, comes into the server relates to the location of the computer. And, and uh, that is used to customize the results. Um, in addition, of course, it's customized based on what we've typed in into the form. In other words, the form is where we can supply information to the web server in performing, in performing our choices. So we typed in Italian restaurants, and it gives us Italian restaurants instead of Asian restaurants or um, sports bars or anything along that lines. All right. So here's the form example that we went over last time. We actually wrote our own little front end that does a Bing search. So, here's the page. All right, we actually did it a couple different ways, and we'll look at each of these. I put these all on one page just to, for simplicity's sake. The first one we'll look at is a text box, and then we'll look briefly at the drop down and the radio button. All right, so if I type something in here, and type go, there it does the search for us. Now let's see how that is accomplished. First of all, I have a form tag. All right, Form tag is always going to have two attributes associated with it, a method and an action. The method is either the word get or it's the word post. Keep in mind, typically when you're creating a website like this, you or members of your team are doing both the client and, are doing both the HTML and the server-side scripting part of this. So you will know what these parameters should be. All right. Well, let's explain what these parameters are in, in this case, and again, in, in other cases, you will know what they are. The method is how you are passing the data from your form to the server. And there's two basic methods. There is get and post. Get means that the data will be put on the query string. Post means it will be sort of posted behind the scenes. So, if we look at this example, oops. and do our search. We'll notice up on the query string is, we'll see the term that we searched for. So notice that we called bing.com search question mark Q equals Italian restaurant. So Data is passed on the query string in these pairs, where there's the name of the field, an equal sign, and the value. So Q is the name of the field, equals Italian restaurant. So Italian restaurant is we typed in, is what we typed in there. If we typed in Asian restaurant, it would say Q equals Asian restaurant. Now why Q? Q is when I did a little reverse engineering and I ran an actual Bing search, Q was the name of the field that the Bing search engine requires. So I just did a regular Bing search and examined the query string and I saw that Q is what it, what it requires. So I used Q. So everything after the question mark is called the query string. And in this case, there's only one value that we're passing. That is the value of the search term. But there could be others. Right? There could be additional fields that we are passing on the query string. And, but all of them will look the same. It'll be the name of the field, an equal sign, and then the value of the field. 
If you have multiple fields, they'll be separated by ampersands. So if I had another piece of data that I was passing, like maybe the language, there'd be an ampersand, the name of the field, an equal sign, and a value. So that explains sort of this half of the URL. This half of the URL is the action. So if you notice, when we look at the action, that matches the URL that gets called up to the query string. This is the name of the server-side script that's going to process the form data. And in this case, it's www.bing.com slash search. Now again, how do I know that? Like I said, I did a little bit of reverse engineering, did a Bing search, and I noticed what the name of the, of the page was called, and so on and so forth. Again, normally the method and the get, either you're the one that's making the server-side page, so you'll know what it needs to be. You get the call at what you want it to be. Or you'll be working with someone who's doing those, someone that's part of your team. So they'll tell you what those values will be. But at anyhow, this is how the data is being passed. This is what is the URL of the server-side script page that's going to process this data. Now for your assignment, use get. I, I think you could use post and it would probably work, but it's probably easier to debug if you use get. And the action is provided in the assignment. I specify the URL that you're going to call. So, the form goes around all that. The form tag starts off here and ends here. And in between it is everything that's going to get sent to the server. Think of the form tag as like being an envelope, that everything inside of it is like a message that you're sending to the server. It's part of your request. Right. This is the address of where you're sending that letter to, or you're sending that request to. Right. This is how you're passing the data. Right. And this is the actual data that we are sending. Now, let's just look first of all at the input tag. Input type of text. Name of Q and an ID of Q. Form fields will often have a name and an ID. All right, those are used for different things. The name is what is going to be sent to the server. So remember I showed you this URL. This is the name. The ID is used for a couple of other things. It's used for JavaScript. And it's also used for this label tag that we'll get to in a minute. Usually, just to, to sort of um, eliminate confusion, I will make the name and the ID the same thing. It just simplifies things. Right. This text box is what we want to call Q on the query string. How do I know that? Well, that's what the URL needs to look at. It needs to look like a Q, have a Q there. Therefore, I gave it the name of Q. So this is a name that gets passed to the server. The value that's going to get passed to the server is simply the value of the text box. In other words, what I've typed in the text box. Text box is a single line of any sort of text data that you can type in. Underneath that, we have a submit button. And I give it an ID of submit. Um, a type of submit and a value of go. The value is going to be the text that's on the button. A submit button sends the data to the server. That's effectively mailing the letter that you're going to send to the server. So you fill in all the form data. You know where it's going to be sent based on the action. You know how it's going to be sent based on the method. You press the submit, bu sub submit button and, and that sends it to the server. And the server then processes it and displays the results. Typically, you make the, uh, you make the form as being an unordered list. Because really, that's what a form is. So it's an unordered list of items. Now, 
again, you may say something like, well, I don't want it to look like a list. I don't want the periods, uh, or I want it, or, uh, you know, the, the dots before the, the, the bullets before the list items, or I don't want them to be on a new line or whatever. That's a CSS issue. If you want something to look different than its default behavior, you do that via CSS. And in this case, I use a couple of things. List style type none to get rid of the bullet points. And I put some styling on it to get the page the way that I want it to look. All right. That's cool. The last item that we're going to consider here is the label. And the label um, is one of those things that we do for accessibility. Um, remember that someone that can see, can see that this text is right next to this text box. So it is. All right. So people that can see can tell that. A screen reader that is reading through your page, though, Sometimes it's not clear what text belongs with what text box. All right, it, it can be very chaotic. What the, what the label tag accomplishes is it links up this text with this input. And it does it via the ID. So the ID for this is Q, and therefore I say the label for Q is this search for. I duplicated this form a couple different ways. A text box, again, is free form text where you can type anything you want to in. But often that's not the best for your form, right? If you have a list of only a certain set of allowable values, it's better to restrict the user to one of those values. So for example, in the pizza example, there's only three sizes for the pizza, small, medium, and large. You can't type in personal, or you can't type in sheet, or anything like that. Our pizza place only serves three sizes of pizzas. So you wouldn't want to use a text box for that, because a text box, the user can freeform type in anything they want. You would want to restrict the user to typing in only certain values. So we looked at two ways to do that last time, one as a, a drop down and one as a radio button. With the drop down, again, it uses a select tag with a set of options. The name goes on the drop down. The options have a value and they have a text between the start and end option. This text here between the start and end tag is what the user is going to see. The value is what's going to be sent to the script. So for example, um, if you were doing an a, uh, online ordering system, um, you might need to send to the, the script the product ID. And the product ID could be like QY7238. Well, your users aren't going to know what that product ID stands for. They're not going to know that it's this item or that item. So you write here, between the start and an option tag, you know, an English language, a user-friendly, a user uh, understandable description of what the product is. And then the value of the option is what the script is going to see. One thing about drop downs is drop downs always have a value. All right. Those of you that have done coding in C sharp, if I'm not mistaken, if you're writing desktop code in C sharp, I think it's possible to have a drop down that does not have a selected value. That's not the case on a web form. The first, if you have not selected something, either what is designated to be the default is the default, or the first item is the default. A radio button is similar to that. 
The difference being is that a radio button, all of the options are shown at the same time. With a drop down, you click on it to get the list of options. Radio buttons also have names and IDs. The name for a radio button group is always going to be the same. That's what makes it a radio button. So in this case, in, this, in the third form example, I have three radio buttons that they're all linked together as one radio button group. That is accomplished by having them all have the same name. That's what tells the browser to treat these like a radio button and if you pick one option, it unselects the other options. They will also, however, have their own ID because the label goes with the individual radio button and not with the radio button group. All right, so that's what we covered last time in, in a nutshell. What I'd like to do now is start from scratch and let's do a whole new, brand new form. All right, and let's say we are doing a form. Let, let's draw the form first. It's always a good idea to draw what you're going to do first before you do it. All right. So let's draw a form that we're going to develop. And let's say it's a form that you're going to fill in if you're interested in some of the programs here at Loring Community College. Let's say this is like a request for information form. All right. This is how we're going to want the form to look. We're going to want to have a name email, an education box that's going to, that's going to have one of three values, high school graduate or high school student, high school graduate, attending college, graduated from college. Yeah. It's going to have those four possible values in. We're then going to want to say, what am I interested in? And I'll put the four CISS careers to our degree path. Software development, web development, mobile, and networking. Then I will have additional comments. And It'll be a box where they can type in multiple lines of comments. Then finally there'll be a submit button where they can submit the data. Now, because we're not, we don't study server-side scripting in this class, we're not going to do anything with this data. But we're going to write the form to collect this data. Now when we analyze this, name is going to be a text box. Email is going to be a text box. Why are those going to be text boxes? Well, we, we have no idea what, you know, names, what can they, names could be any set of characters. So we're just going to allow the person to type in their name. Education, we're going to want them to choose between one of these four categories. And let's say in our system, this is category one, this is category two, category three, and category four. We wouldn't want a text box where they typed in one, two, three, or four right because users aren't going to know what one two three or four mean all right ideally we would want a drop down or a radio button um, because drop downs and radio buttons limit the user to picking one of several predefined options all right keep in mind those of you that have done any database work 
that this might be information get, that gets stored in a database. And there might be things like keys and alternate keys, or not alternate keys, but foreign keys and, and integrity constraints and so on. Whereas you have to put in a value of one through four. All right, you can't put in some other value. So therefore, it would be important for a form to limit the user into choosing only one of the legal values. Now, interest is something that we're not going to use a drop-down or a radio button for. Why are we not going to use a drop-down or a radio button for interest? Yes? Could be interested in all of them. They could be interested in one, two, three, or four of them, right? So therefore, we would not want that to be a drop-down or a radio button because typically drop-downs and radio buttons are created so that um, you, know, the, the, you have a set of mutually exclusive options. Now, there'd be ways around it and so on, but for the most part, that, that's a true statement. Finally, the additional comments is not going to be a text box because typically we're going to want people to um, have the opportunity to put in multiple lines of data. So it's not just going to be like uh, a name or something like that. It, you might write a paragraph there explaining that you have a degree in software development, but you graduated in 1995, and therefore your skills aren't up to date or something like that. You know. OK, so let's go and let's build this form. I'm going to start out with no CSS so we can practice building that CSS again. Um, our method I'm going to keep as being get because I'm going to want to pass the data on the query string. The action will be some server-side script on our web server that's going to actually process this request. Maybe it generates an automated email that goes to this user. All right. We don't know what that is. Usually what I do when I'm prototyping this, if I know the name of the script, what the script is going to be, I'll put that in. So if I knew the script was going to be like process.php, I'd put process.php in. All right. If I didn't know the name of the script, I would put in a pound sign, just as sort of a placeholder. And we know from what we talked about before that a pound sign simply means reload the top of the page. Right, of course. That's what it means. All right. So let's go in and let's create this one at a time. Here is my unordered list. Again, as I put the starting tag in, I automatically put the ending tag in. Every one of my form items is going to kind of look like this. We have a label. And that label is going to match up with the ID of the input box. What name do I give to this text box? Well, it needs to match what the name of the script is going to be. And if I was writing the script, I would get to choose that. And in this case, we don't have a script, so we're going to pretend like I was writing the script later today. All right. 
So I would call the name txt name. One thing I often do is I'll put a little prefix that tells me what that form control is. So I'll put txt name, meaning that it is um, a text box. You certainly don't have to do that if you don't want to. In fact, I'm not going to do that. Remember, this has to match. The ID has to match the label for. And the name has to match what the server side script is expecting. So that's the name. Let's now put in email address. Now, I'm going to go look at this form now, simply because um, it's good to periodically look at something when you're developing it, as opposed to developing a whole giant set of code and then go and look at it at the very end. All right, it's, it's better to code a little bit, look at it, code a little bit, look at it, in my mind. So I'm going to do this, and I'm going to look at the styling of this. So I look at it, and that's what it looks like. And a few things I don't like about it. I don't like the fact there's a bullet point. I don't like the way those things line up. All right? I agree. So we're going to do some styling here to, to change the style of this form. All right? So... Let's go in here and keep in mind that anything that you can do to any other thing on your page, style-wise, you can do to a form. So I'm going to, first of all, for the, this unordered list, I'm going to say list style type. None. I could do that, right? Of course I could do that. I just did that, right? And boom, it got rid of the bullet point. I saw that. Got rid of it, all right. All right. But I might do this instead. Form UL. And let's see what that does. Did the same thing. Why might this be better than just UL? Yes. In case you have other unordered lists that have bullet points that you do want to show. Yeah. All right. That. This will simply uh, this style will only applies to ULs within a form tag. All right. Now we could do some other things. We could center the form, for example. We could put a border around it. So let's do some of those things. I think I did those in the other example as well. I can say border two pixel solid black. And remember, I could say border width two pixel, border color black, border type solid. But the shorthand methods allow you to sort of combine those. Yeah, that's right. With
A-A-A-A-F-F. What color do you think that will be? Well, what's the biggest of the three pairs of values? These two are equal. What's a bigger value, AA or FF? F, FF is. FF is. All right, because remember, in hexadecimal 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. So F is the highest single digit in hexadecimal. So highest, highest. And this is, you know, this is a little bit lower. So we have the red and the green the same, and we have blue the highest. So this is going to be some shade of blue. All right? And so uh, because it's going to have elements of the red and green in it, it's going to be a light shade of blue, um, a pale shade of blue. If, we, if those numbers were zeros, then it would be uh, a vivid blue. If we look at this, it's, I, I got another answer for this. It's an ugly shade of blue. All right? We could change this to look like this, see what we come up with. Uh, I don't really like that. Um, hey, why worry about that? Let's just go to a color chart. And we can go and look at the color chart. And you can refer to a color chart either by a name or by a color. Let's say that this is a nice blue. Oh, this is this hex code. I'd have been here a while typing that in until I got that. So it is important to understand how these hex codes work, but also remember you can use a chart too. And there we go. Yeah, that's, that's the color I was looking for. Now, one thing I don't like about this as well is the way that these are jagged. All right, these things don't really line up. All right, it would be nice if all these labels lined up and all of the text boxes lined up. Exactly. All right, so let's see how we could handle that. I could say label, width, 100 pixels. Let's see what that does. Does absolutely nothing. Why did it do absolutely nothing? Did I type something in wrong? No, no typos. What do widths apply to? What has a width? Block tags have widths. La uh, labels are not block tags. Labels are inline tags. So therefore, a width will not apply to a label. So I have to go in and say, hey, I want this to be sort of a weird inline block hybrid. And now, boom, it applies. All right? So that looks kind of cool. All right? But maybe we can even do better, because maybe we could have these things align on the right. And we could do that by saying on the label, text align right. And I didn't spell that right. And I kind of like that. All right? Yeah, I kind of like that too. That was pretty cool. Font weight bold. And so on. All right? 
thing to remember is we can style this, the, we can apply any other style rule like we have done for any other things. All right, so now, education. Remember, we have those four categories. Do we want to use a radio button or a drop down? I think I drew it as a drop down, but could we use a radio button? Sure. All right. When do, well, radio buttons and drop downs are typically interchangeable. All right. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, they, they are interchangeable. Uh, and they are when you have a list of um, mutually exclusive options. All right. Someone is either a high school student or a high school graduate, a college student, or a college graduate. All right. Especially if we say highest level of education achieved. All right. What would dictate which we would want to use? Well, it's largely a screen issue. It's largely a display issue. Um, if you have a whole bunch of options, you're typically going to use a drop down. If you have a few options, you could use either a drop down or you could use radio buttons. In this case, I'm going to use a drop down. So I'm going to go in here. You do not use an input tag for a drop down. You use a select tag. And then you have a series of option tags. Whoops. And remember, the value of the option tag is what the script is going to see. Between the start and end is going to be what the user sees. So for example, in this case, a user is not likely to know what uh, a value of one represents. So we want to display that one represents a high school student. Two represents, whoops. High school graduate. Three represents a college student. And four represents a college graduate. College graduate, yeah. So we go and look at this, and there we have the options. All right. If we do not like the fact that these are spaced right on top of each other, how could we fix that? Notice that the, aim and the name and the email and the uh, highest level are stacked right on top of each other. How can we fix that? There could be more than one correct answer. Notice that there's no space. You're going to use CSS. Margin or padding, would, would, would either one of those would accomplish that. Um, again, um, I like that you first of all said, first of all it's CSS. Because that's sort of an important thing to identify like right off the bat. All right? Because if I didn't have any idea of what to do, at the very least, I know that it's a CSS is issue. 
How do I know it's a CSS issue? Because I'm dealing strictly with the appearance of the page. And We could try either one of them, but let's do a margin bottom of 5px. All right. And now there's a little bit of gap between them. Yeah. All right. Next thing we have to do on our form is what they're interested in. Software, web, mobile, and networking. Now, could we use drop downs for these? We could. Yeah. Could we use one drop down for these? And the answer is not with what we've learned so far. All right? There actually is sort of a way that we could do it. But uh, for the most part, if we're going to do use drop downs for these, we'd use a drop down for each one of them. We'd have a yes or no. Are you interested in software? Yes or no. Are you interested in um, web development? Yes or no. Are you interested in web? Yes or no. Interested in mobile? Yes or no. Networking? Yes or no. We can also do that with radio buttons. Are you interested in networking? Radio button for yes, radio button for no. Fortunately, there's an easier way to do it, and that's with, with a checkbox. The difference between a checkbox and a radio button is that checkboxes are never mutually exclusive. So I just have a check to indicate yes, and unchecked simply indicates no. So. I could do this. And there's the checkbox. It can be yes or it can be no. Yes or no. Notice how cleaner that, whoops. Notice how cleaner that is than having a drop down or radio buttons. That is much cleaner. So I have input type equals checkbox instead of that. I need one other thing for this. I need to tell the script what checked means. So I'll put a value in here. And we'll see in a minute how this comes into play. Now, notice that when I first go to the page, it is not checked. How can I make it checked? How can I set the default to checked? I can set the default to be checked by saying checked equals checked. And then when I load the page up, it's checked by default. So it is. Now, defaults are something that you should carefully consider when you're building a form. 
Um, by properly choosing defaults, um, you can make the form entry go easier for your users and make it more user-friendly. User um, but you want to be sure that you select uh, valid defaults. All right. So for example, highest level. What was the default for that field on this page? Well, it's simply the first option, right? Because I haven't specified the default. So in a drop down, if I don't specify a default, the default is simply the first option. All right. How do I make something else? By saying the option selected equals selected. That will make one of the other fields a default. So now it defaults to college student. Now what if, what if there wasn't a default value? What do I mean by default value? I mean the value that probably most people on the site are going to have. All right. If we're doing a website for people interested in Lorain County Community College though, there are people that come to Lorain Community College from other places, but most of the people that attend Lorain County Community College are from Lorain County. So if there was a drop down that says the county that you live in, it would make sense to make the default Lorain County because most people have that. However, you'd still want the other options to be there. All right. If you wanted to say what the default for this field is, I don't know what the proper value would be. Are most people coming here high school graduates or high school students or college students or college? Who knows? I don't have any good way of knowing. So what I would do is I would put a dummy value at the beginning. Maybe with a value of zero that says, please select. And if you don't specify the default, the first value is the default. So that way that would force them to select one of the values. If you make something the default and it's not really the default, you're going to have people erroneously skip that field and get the wrong value. All right, let's go and finish this up. I'll put the other checkboxes in here. And there we go. And they're all checked to be checked. All right. Usually what organizations do is they sort of set the defaults in their favor. For example, um, if you go and register for a site, it will say, do you want the, the newsletter? And they'll have it selected yes. That way, by default, that is selected. All right, last thing we need to add to this is a area for additional information.
and that is a text area. And there we have it. Now we can do something like specify a height and width in for the text area. But keep in mind that even if you do specify a height and width for the text area, well, that's a big one. That text areas are unlimited. So it will just start scrolling if you add more stuff to it. make it not quite so big. Finally, the last thing we need is we need a submit button. And what does the submit button do? It actually sends a value to uh, black sends, it to. sends it to what? Sends it to the web server to be processing, processed. You can give the submit button a name if you want, or an ID if you want. All right. Now, I want you to notice something. I'm going to fill in this form, I'm going to submit it, and then we're going to look at the URL that it sends us to. And we're going to try to make sure we understand the URL that it sent it to. So I'm going to enter in name of Mike, email address, mzellers at lorraineccc.edu. Please select. I'll check all of those and I'll select that I'm a college graduate and so on and I'll click go. Let's look at the query string. It sent it to form.html. Why did it send that? Because I said the, the action was a pound sign. That's going to submit the form back to itself which is not uncommon because sometimes forms have the logic to process it. Name equals Mike. Email equals mzellers at loanccc.edu. Education equals four. Why did it say education equals four? Because I picked college graduate and that is the value associated with college graduate. Web equals Y, mobile equals Y, software equals Y, networking equals Y. Why is that the case? Because each one of these fields had a name and because they were checked it sent the value.
And then finally, if we look at the URL, the comments are what I typed in and so on. Actually, I'm going to do a little better than what I did. I'm just going to say action, e um, action equals an empty string, nothing. That will send it back to itself. But again, notice how it used the value from here and the value from here. What if I don't select any of these? <coughs> notice how it didn't put it on the query string. So if you do not select something in a checkbox, it doesn't put a value of no. It simply does not put any value there. All right. Um, let's see. We have two more topics to cover with regards to forms. One of them is how you can break a form into sections. So let's go look at this form. I could identify two sections to this form. I could identify this, which is sort of personal information, then this section, which is about the person's interests. On some forms, you might have a billing address and a shipping address. All right? So there's a way to divide a form into sections. Now, how do you do that? Let's Google it. Let's say I say I forgot what it is. Hypothetical situation. I forget the tag for this. Form section. form section. And I can look in here and oh, there's a field set. There's a field set and a legend. And what these things are, and again, these are useful, both in helping people visually. Uh, organize a form, but assistive technology can use the legend to, uh, to help people understand um, the form if they're using assistive technology such as a screen reader. So what I could do is I could do something like this. In this case, I would have each of these two sections in their own UL. And I could put a field set tag. Around the first set of things. And a field set tag around the last. Set of things. How might you use this in a pizza example? A field set. Well, there's a section of the form that's about the person, their name, their phone number, and so on, address. There's a, a section of the form about the pizza. Um, or there's a section of the form about the toppings, or whatever. However you think it will be best organized. Uh, with the field set, there's a legend then. Well, I can type in legend, and I can say personal information.
And there you go. And that divides the form into two little sections. I'm going to go turn off the color for this form just so that we can maybe more easily see this. There's two like little sections within the form. I'll get rid of the border on the form too so we can see those sections even better. And of course we can style this. We can make the field set have a different sort of border. And we can make the legend be bigger. One point two EM, for example. And then the form looks like that. All right. The last topic we have about forms, and we won't get into tables at all today. I know you're heartbroken, but that will just give you something to look forward to for next week. Right. Uh, the last thing that we're going to cover with forms are additions to HTML for HTML5. Everything I talked about here is HTML4 and HTML5. So all the tags I talked about here existed in HTML4, and they still exist in HTML5. But in HTML5, there have been some additional tags created that makes your life a little easier. For example, a text box is a text box. I could put any text inside of it. So I could put numbers, letters, all kinds of things. There may be some type cases where you want the data to be formatted a certain way. You want the data to be an email address, for example. All right. Or if you had a number, put in your age. Well, you want that to be a number. You don't want, excuse me, you don't want someone to type in just any old letters for age. Or if you have a date, you might want them to put in a, a valid date. You don't want them to just type anything in for the date. So text boxes in HTML4 were just plain old text boxes. So how did you make sure that they typed in a date if it was a date. You would use JavaScript to do that. In HTML5, however, there are some additional form controls that make your life easier. Now, if they make your life easier, why don't we talk about these in the first place? Not all browsers support them. And we'll see what a browser does when it doesn't support them when we look in a minute. So let me look in W3 Schools. And let's look up HTML5 Let's look up form element. HTML5 form elements talks about some new ones here. Uh, HTML5 input types. There are a couple things in HTML4 we didn't talk about. One is a password control. And a password control, you say type equals password, and then when you type something in, it shows a dot. There's a reset button that's used to clear out the values in a form. I generally avoid the reset button because it causes more trouble than it's worth. In your course search, 
here on campus, if you search for a course, if you don't hit the right button, it doesn't do the search, it clears out all your options. And therefore, and it can be very maddening and angering. Therefore, I avoid using that. Here are the HTML5 things. And we'll see how it does on a browser that doesn't support them. One of the examples is date. All right. So I can click date. And if I click the pop-up, up, up pops a little calendar. So I could pick the date that I want. I'm also not allowed to type in any old stuff. Notice I just hit the keys, I'm hitting the letter keys, nothing goes in. I have to type in something valid. But I can't type in the 15th month, I just tried to do that. It gave me the 12th month. If I hit submit, it will tell me that that date is invalid. That's great, right? Regular text boxes don't do this. Regular text boxes allow anything in. However, if I try this on an older browser, it's not going to work. So notice here, I can type anything I want to in this version of Internet Explorer. I can submit the query, and it tells me that that's the date that was received. Um, remember I mentioned a while ago, a useful site that you can go to is Can I Use? But can I use? And what that will do is that will show you if I look up HTML5 form features. It shows me this light green, which is not fully supported like the dark green is, which means that some of those options do not work in almost all the browsers. But notice what happens if it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, it acts like a plain old text box, which just puts you back to where you were before. All right? which means you still would have to write JavaScript. So I would say at least for a short period of time in the future, if you, you can feel free to use the HTML5 form controls, but know that you're going to have to write redundant JavaScript that's going to go and validate these because you can't depend on someone having a browser that supports um, HTML5 controls. This again is known as graceful degradation. In other words, if you're on a lower-end browser, it doesn't break. It doesn't do everything that you want it to, but it doesn't break. Other examples. An email address. Our form here that we had a minute ago had an email address in it, but we could type anything we wanted to in it. Whereas this, with the email address, if we type that in and try to submit it, it will tell us there must be an at sign in the email address. Month, number, input range, that gives us a slider where you can slide like a volume control. Telephone number, time, URL, and so on down the line. These are all more specialized versions of the, the, of the text box. And they're, they're for things that are very commonly used. Dates, email addresses, URLs, and so on. Therefore, it's important um, if you're developing something, to consider using them, even though you know that they won't work on some browsers. And you'll just have to write some redundant code to handle those people whose browsers don't support those. And that would typically be JavaScript. 
<coughs> the alternative for that would be using just a plain old text box and then you'd have to write JavaScript anyhow. At least people that uh, have HTML5 browsers uh, that can handle the form tags uh, or the input types rather will get the benefit of those um, if, you, if you use them. Any questions about any of this? Any questions about your project? All right, I'm going to pick up on Tuesday about tables. We'll go over Tuesday. Uh, we'll, we'll start tables on Tuesday. We'll probably get them mostly all done on Tuesday. And then we will get into JavaScript also next week. Questions? All right, we'll see you over in lab.